Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. It is a blessing to be here once again to study God's Word with each of you. I pray that the Lord will bless you this morning as we study His Word and as we contemplate what I believe to be such an important subject. You know, I'm not going to try to preach this morning. I'm going to kind of, I'd rather just have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with each of you on this subject. If you look at the bulletin, uh, it says faith or presumption. And in our scripture reading from Psalms uh, 19, 13, speaks about keeping us from the sins of presumption. Presumption is a sin, my brothers and sisters. And any sin, whether it's physical sin, physical temptation, or presumptuous sins, that if they are not confessed and repented of, they're not forgiven. And we don't want to be left outside of the kingdom of heaven because of any types of sins that Satan may present to us to seduce us. So it is an important topic, and I honestly don't know if our people understand what the sin of presumption is. How, how can we avoid it if we don't know what it is? And in our scripture reading, Psalms 19, 13, David prays to the Lord to keep thy servant from presumptuous sins and let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. It is a great transgression. We, we've been studying about that in Sabbath school. What is faith? And what does faith have to do with presumption? Oh, it has everything to do. So we want to understand this topic. We want to be able to understand clearly what it is. You know the temptations that Jesus endured when he was here in this world. He endured three temptations. We know the wilderness experience. The Spirit led him out into the wilderness to be tempted. In those three temptations, we're told in the book uh, Testimonies, Volume 4, page 44, we're told that these are the great temptations that we have to encounter. We all have to face. I'm reading Volume 4, page 44. We're told, in the wilderness of temptation, Christ met the great leading temptations that will assail men. Temptations can be summarized in, in those three uh, situations that Jesus had to confront. Now, you remember the first one, right? The first one was about the bread. That's the appetite. That's a physical temptation. That's a temptation that attacks our desires, our appetites. They, they attack our flesh, fleshly temptations. The Bible speaks about physical temptations and the temptations of the flesh. But that's just the first one. Brothers, that's just the first one. Can we get to the next one, which is even much more serious? So I'm reading here. The first, she says, the first great temptation was upon appetite. The second was presumption. That's what we need to study this morning. I think we understand physical temptation. I, I think we preach about it. I hope we're preaching about it. I hope we're overcoming those things. But the temptation of presumption is on a whole different category. Let me read this to you. By the way, she says that the, the first temptation, the physical temptation, has to do with the gratifications of our tastes. And it also has to do with our lusts. It's physical. But what about the second one? What was the second temptation of Christ? Throw yourself. Throw yourself from the, from the cliff, from the pinnacle. And the Lord's going to take care of everything. Notice that's the sin of presumption. She says the second temptation was presumption. Now listen to this. Presumption is a common temptation. It happens more often than we can imagine. But listen, 
It's a common temptation. And as Satan assails men with this, he obtains the victory nine times out of ten. What do you think about that? You know, we, we understand physical temptation. At least we ought to. And we ought to be aggressive in our spiritual warfare against sin and temptation. The flesh and the lusts and the appetites. But how about the sin of presumption? Do we know what it is? And can, are we ready to confront that issue? What if I told you this morning that tonight the devil has a special temptation that he's going to assail you with. He's going to present to you. And you have only 10% chance of gaining the victory. Satan's going to try to seduce you. He's going to try to cause you to lose your way. He wants you to lose your soul. And he's going to bring a temptation, and he has 90% chance of success on you tonight. What would you say? What would you think? That's not very encouraging. But it's the truth. And that's why we have to know what presumption is. Save us, like David says, save us from the sin of presumption. Most of our people don't know what it is. Or at least I should say, we don't know what God has said about this situation. And so how can we be prepared to have the victory over something that has a 90% chance of causing us to lose our way? How will we be prepared if we don't know what God has said on this subject? Brothers, and we're still trying to gain the victory over physical temptation. And if by God's grace, listen, this is the great thing about the gospel. If by God's grace, he gives us the power, he gives us the strength, he gives us the victory over the flesh, the things that are causing us to sin. If by God's grace, we can get the victory over those things. You know, we would realize that this Life is wonderful when we're in God's will, but Satan doesn't stop. He comes then with what is called a double whammy. You know what a double whammy is? If by God's grace we are able to overcome some of the things of this world, the devil just comes back with another temptation that's even much more powerful. Oh, brothers, we need to understand this. So what is presumption? I'm reading from Manuscript Release, volume 18, page 333. And we're told, the path of faith lies close beside the path of presumption. Oh, they're close. They're almost identical. Satan is ever seeking to lead us into a false path. See, faith is from God. Presumption is a counterfeit. You, you know what a counterfeit is? Have you heard of the counterfeit Sabbath? We, we know what that is clearly. God has his seventh day Sabbath. The devil has his counterfeit. Have you heard of the counterfeit church? God has his true church in Revelation chapter 12. How about Revelation 17? There's a woman, right, riding a beast. That's the counterfeit. And listen, my brothers and sisters, God has true, genuine, saving faith. And the devil has a counterfeit to faith. It looks like faith. It sounds like faith. It's preached like faith in churches. It is received and embraced by people who think it's faith. But it's not faith. It's presumption. It's a sin of presumption. It's a counterfeit. Brothers and sisters, it's a, it's, a, it's a presumption that will lead to disappointment. Brothers, we need righteousness by faith if we're going to be saved. And not unrighteousness by presumption. It looks the same, but it's not the same. 
So what's, what's the difference, Andy? What's the difference? Well, let me read to you from Desire of Ages, page 126. We're getting down to the heart of this matter. It says, and then we're going to look at some examples just to reinforce what this says here. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption. For presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Now, what's the difference? Faith claims the promises of God. Praise the Lord. Does God have promises in his word? God says he's going to save us. God says he'll be with us. God says he'll never forsake us. God says we're going we're to be victorious. Those are promises. And faith claims and grabs holds of those promises. You know what presumption does? Presumption also claims the promises. It does the same thing. It, it claims the promises. It speaks of the promises. It preaches the promises. But what's the difference? She says, faith claims the promises and brings forth fruits of obedience. There's a big difference. She says, presumption also claims the promises, but uses them. It uses the word of God, uses the promises of God as an excuse for transgression as Satan did. Therein lies the difference. They both preach the same thing. They both say the same thing. And in the minds of those who, who are seduced by presumption, they think it's the same thing, but it's not. She goes on to say, faith would have led our first parents, that's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It would have led them to trust the love of God and obey his commandments. That's true saving faith. They would have trusted what God said. God says, don't eat. You can have everything. What's wrong with every fruit in the world? What's wrong with every fruit? That's not bad. That's, that's a lot of fruit. But he says, there's one you can't touch. And if they had true saving faith, they would have trusted God's word and they would have done what he asked. But what does Satan do in the same garden? What did Satan do? It says that he used presumption to cause them to disobey. Oh, God loves you. That's true. Oh, God, he doesn't want nobody to be bad, feel sad. That's true. But then he'll come and say, but God is not that particular about what we eat. There's the disobedience. There's the justification. There's a philosophy, not revelation. That's, that's angelic devising, or in our case, human devisings. And it sounds good. And to the flesh, it appeals to our flesh. And it's a carnal message. It's okay. Brothers and sisters, God is not that particular. That's what the devil said. The law, his commandments, is not important. Let me Presumption led them to transgress the law of God. That's the desire of ages 126. What's happening in this world today? What's happening in this generation? Uh, we want to change God's law too. We want to redefine the principles of morality. It doesn't matter. It's whatever you feel, whatever you think. Whatever makes you feel good. Because God is not that particular about what he, we think he wants. She goes on to say, they used presumption led to transgression, believing that his great love would save them from the consequence of their sin. God is with us. God wants to save us. God, that's what Satan said to Jesus. Th throw yourself off because God loves you. God's going to protect you. And you don't have to worry about it. Brothers, that was a sin of presumption. Not only does presumption come with regards to the, the law of God, but also to the counsels and the, the advice 
and even the other matters that are not contained in the law of God. I'm reading from Medical Ministry, page 230. She says, if we neglect to do that which is within our reach and ask the Lord to relieve pain when we are too indolent to make use of these natural remedies within our power, it is simply presumption. What is she saying? If I'm hurt, if I'm in pain, and I ask God, Lord, take away my pain, and he has put within my reach simple remedies, like water, rest. How about rest? Is rest going to relieve our pain and stress and anxiety? How about exercise? Is exercise going to help produce good health? How about eating right? Is eating right going to generate health? Yes, my brothers. He has already given us some of the simple remedies that we can start today to help produce and to help minimize some of our physical ailments. But she says, if we're too indolent, what does indolent mean? That's lazy. That's, sit that's sitting in the lazy boy. You know, the lazy boy chair? If we're too indolent to do what God has told us, how we can achieve those things, some of them, some of them, there, there's some things we can't do. Okay? There's some things, and the things that we can't do, we have to trust the promise of God. And we have to depend upon God to help us with it. But brothers, there's some simple things that we can do. Lord, give me a job. I need a job. But then I don't take the time out to at least get out the door. Lord, finish the work, but I'm not getting out of my seat. No, brothers, it's presumption. I'm waiting for God to do all this when God has already told me what I need to do. That's presumption. So there are some things we can do, but we and the things that we can do, we have to cooperate and we have to trust and we have to work together. First Corinthians 3, 9 says, for we are fellow laborers together with God. We work together with him to accomplish wonderful things. God doesn't want to do it all, my brothers. Did you know that? God could do it all. But he wants us to have a part. He wants us to be his partners. You know, sometimes we think we want to work somewhere in some company or in some corporation. If I can work here, that would be one. God wants to work with you to accomplish his divine will. And, he, and, and there are things that we can do. And those things we can, he expects us to do. We're going to look at three examples and we're going to close. Just three examples. We're going to look at one example from the Old Testament, one for the, from the New Testament. We're going to look at one for Adventists. You think that'd be okay? Can we do that? Can we apply God's word in our life? Yes, brothers, we must. So we're going to look at three examples of presumption. Aren't you glad I'm not preaching today? Aren't you glad I'm just having a talk with you? <laughs> the first one is Uzzah. Uzzah was a man who touched the ark of God. And this was a time, you remember when David and the nation of Israel... Oh, they were, David was dancing before the Lord. The Bible says he was dancing before the Lord. We've heard that phrase so many times. And the nation was celebrating because the ark was coming back. Uh, God wasn't celebrating too much. And I'll tell you why. Let me read to you from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 706. This, we're dealing with presumption. It says, David and his people had assembled to perform a sacred work. That's good, right? It's, that's a good thing to do. We have a sacred work to do. And they had engaged in it with glad and willing hearts. Do we want people to have a willing heart when they come to missionary or when they come to church? Yes, that's wonderful. But, but the Lord could not accept 
the service because it was in it was not performed in accordance with his directions and then she goes on to say that the philistines had no knowledge of god's law they didn't have any writings from moses as to how the ark has to be treated they didn't have the oracles that said, you're not supposed to touch it. They were ignorant of those things. They didn't have the same light that Israel had. And guess what? When the Philistines touched the ark, the Lord did not smite them dead. He didn't smite them because they didn't know. They were ignorant. They didn't know how the sanctuary was to be treated. The, I'm sorry, the ark. And they touched the ark and they put it on the cart and they send it back to the nation of Israel and say, we don't, we don't want this. And the Lord did not smite them for touching the ark. But did Israel have instructions? Did Israel have a law as to how the ark was to be treated? And the attitude that we ought to have in sacred, in holy, and in worship to God, did they have instructions? Yes, they did. And she goes on to say, the Philistines had, known, had not a knowledge of God's law and had placed the ark upon the cart and it was returned to Israel and the Lord accepted the effort which they made because they didn't know. What about Israel? He was not pleased. And she goes on to say, presumption, she says, but the Israelites had in their plain hands the plain statements of the will of God in all these matters, and their neglect of these instructions was dishonoring to God. But they thought it was, everything was good. They were happy. David danced before the Lord. The nation was rejoicing. Wonderful, the ark is coming back. You know, brothers and sisters, there are fashionable sins today that dishonor God too. The, there are popular sins in this generation. And the world says, these things are wonderful. They're dancing in the streets. Can you imagine that? They're jumping up for joy. They're celebrating in sin. And in their minds, they think that they can invoke God's name in those Things that go against his written word. Imagine that. The Lord was displeased. Here's what she said regarding Uzzah, the man who touched the ark. Upon Uzzah rested the greater guilt of presumption. You see, we're studying the sin of presumption. We have to know what it is, brothers. Remember, 90%. And we only got 10%. But, you know, with God, we, we can do it with half a percent if God's with us. Satan can have a 99.999% of victory, but if we have God on our side, all we need is a 0.0001%, and God will grant us a victory if we're faithful. Notice what she said about the sin of presumption with Uzzah. Transgression of God's law had lessened his sense of the sacredness, that's of the ark, and with unconfessed sins upon him, and in the face of divine prohibition, presumed to touch the symbol of God's presence. God cannot accept partial obedience or no lax way of treating his commandments. Partial obedience, a lack of obedience, and going directly contrary to the word of God. He lost his life, my brothers and sisters. And we, and we think we're going to have eternal life with partial obedience, a lack of obedience, and going contrary to what God says, we think we have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, that's presumption. That's not faith. And you can dance all you want. Now, there is a joy. Don't get me wrong. There is a joy in holiness and in obedience. And yes, if we make it to heaven, brother, we, I, I, I think... The Bible says we shall leap like the heart. Have you ever read that in Isaiah? We shall leap like the heart. But that's because we're there. And our sins have been forgiven. 
There's a joy that we will not know, brothers, until we get to God's city. Now, that's the first example. Two, two more. The second example is the city of Jerusalem. And specifically, on the day, and the day was 70 AD, the year 70 AD, the day that Jerusalem was destroyed. What happened, my brothers? What, what was a great sin that was taking place the day Jerusalem was destroyed in 7 AD? It wasn't the physical temptation. It was a sin of presumption. That's what caused the destruction of Jerusalem. Let me read that to you. This is from Great Controversy, page 29. Listen to this. It says the leaders, these, these are within the city. The leaders of the different uh, opposing factions, you know, we have opposing factions here today. You know, in, in, in the days of Christ, they had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Some believed in this, some believed in that. You had the Hellenists that had influence with Greek uh, thought. Then you had the, uh, the Zealots. You heard about the Zealots? Boy, they, they were the rabble rousers. They, they were against any kind of... They, they wanted the Romans out. Then you had all kinds of different factions. So these leaders, it says, they were uniting to torture and plunder their wretched victims. And they fell upon each other's forces and slaughtered without mercy. Even the sanctity of the temple could not restrain this horrible ferocity. There wasn't much unity. They crucified Christ. They were, they, were, they, they were killing the disciples and persecuting uh, the followers of Christ. And then they began to fall upon each other. Once the, the disciples left, right? Before the destruction of Jerusalem, the disciples were gone. They saw the signs and they fled Jerusalem. So they fell upon each other. They began to fight among themselves. And notice... <clears throat> The worshipers were stricken down before the altar. Imagine that. And the sanctuary was polluted with the bodies of the slain. Here it is. Yet in their blind and blasphemous presumption. Great controversy. Page 26. In their blind and blasphemous presumption, the instigators of this hellish work publicly declare this was a day that Jerusalem was destroyed by the way they publicly declared that they had no fear that Jerusalem would be destroyed for it was God's own city to establish their power more firmly they bribed false prophets to proclaim listen even while the Roman legions were besieging the temple, the Romans were coming into temple, slaughtering. And even as that was happening, here's what they said. They bribed false prophets to proclaim that the people were to wait. Just hold on. Stay in the temples. Let's stay here in Jerusalem. Wait for the deliverance from God. Did it come? It did not come. Th did they repent for killing Jesus? Did they repent for persecuting the disciples? Did they repent of their disobedience and sin and rebellion against God? No, they had not. And they, they, they perished. That's what presumption leads to. That's great controversy 25. It was blind, blasphemous presumption that could not allow them to see what Jesus was trying to tell them, what the Holy Spirit was trying to convict them. Brothers, do you see how dangerous presumption is? That was a delusion. My last example. How about us? Oh, that, oh Jerusalem, how could they do such a thing? What about us? Let me read this and we'll close. Let me read this one. This is letter 55, 1886. You know the statement. We've all heard it. We've all preached it. It's a promise. It's a promise. Faith claims the promise. 
We have to claim the promise. There's no question about it. We depend on God's promises. We cannot get through this life. We cannot do this work without the promises of God. That he will empower the work, that he'll give his Holy Spirit, that he will be with us, and that we will get through anything this world can offer. Or any persecution or hardship that, or challenge this world can give us. The promises of God says we're going to get through. Let me read it to you. But remember, presumption also claims a promise. And they preach the promise. And they, they encourage people to embrace the promise, but it's not the promise. It's presumption. Notice, here's the promise. Letter 55, 1886. We're told, the church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. Have you heard the promise? Have you heard that? Do you believe it? I believe the promise, my brothers. I believe that. But my brothers and sisters, does that give me the liberty and the license to live the way I want to live and to do what I want to do and to disobey and to disregard? No, it doesn't, my brothers. She says, the church may appear to fall, but it does not fall. It remains as the sinners of Zion will be sifted out and the chaff separated from the precious wheat. That's a promise. But the promise is going to be fulfilled to someone. Can I, can I read the rest of this, the very next sentence? Can I read the next sentence? See, this part of the statement, those who embrace presumption don't want to understand. They don't want to read. Those who want to live the way they want, they don't accept the full promise. Here's, here's what it continues to say. The very next sentence. None but those who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by their word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and the true. Do you still believe the promise of God? Only those who overcome will be found among the loyal and the true. What does it mean? Those who overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony will be found with the loyal and true. How, will they, how are they described? She says, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. Do we still believe that part? Do we still believe that? Do we, is that what we want? Yes, my brothers. That's what we need. She says, the remnant that purifies their soul by obeying the truth. That's still letter 55. That's still the same statement. Those who purify their souls through obedience of the truth. There's a difference. That's what makes a difference. Faith, it doesn't just profess the promise. It doesn't just claim it. It doesn't just preach it. But it, what? it says that they purify their souls through obedience to the truth of God. Oh, my brothers and sisters. What do, we, what do we have? What is my experience this morning? And you touched on this in, during the announcements. Do we have that faith in that promise? Or do we have a presumption? Oh, brothers, it's not the same thing. And then she closes with this. This is, this is, this is a, we need to preach letter 55. We have to preach that message. It starts out with the church may appear to fall. And it closes with this. The remnant that purifies their soul in obeying the truth will gather strength from the trying process, exhibiting the beauty of holiness amid the surrounding apostasy. Praise the Lord. While the world is perishing in sin and disobedience outside, what's going to be the experience inside? The beauty of holiness and obedience. Oh, my brothers and sisters, that's faith. That's saving faith. That's righteousness by faith. And that, my brothers, has a right to the promise of God. 
Brothers, anything less than that is going to be lost. Presumptions looks at sounds, it claims, it says all those things, but it fails to the power of God to bring their life under the will of God. Oh, my brothers, how is it in our life today? We must proclaim the promises. That's the only hope we have in this world. But in order to have the authority to see those promises fulfilled in our life, we have to come to a relationship with Christ that will grant us the authority. You know what Revelation 14 says? Revelation 22, 14? Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right. The Greek word is the authority to enter the gates of the city. Oh, praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you for your care, for your protection. We thank you for this congregation. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Help us, Lord, to understand that there's a sin that we all have to a greater or to a lesser degree have not understood in our lives. Lord, help us, as David say, save us, Lord, from the sins of presumption. Then we can stand before you blameless. Give us a victory over physical temptation and all the things of this world that would cause us to lose our way. Anything that's interfering from us establishing that closeness with you, remove them. We ask in Jesus' name. Be with your church. Give us this experience that we read about so that we can be ready to meet you in the clouds of glory. And Lord, we don't know when that will be. And it may be sooner than later, but Lord, if it's sooner, we want to be ready. Once again, we thank you and we ask you to give us that grace so that we can conform, comprehend, and communicate this wonderful truth you've given to us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.